All right, guys, part two of my template deep dive. Thanks for the <laughs> the never-ending request to dig deeper, and you guys are techie and nerdy, which I'd feel bad calling you that if I wasn't, you know, one of you. Um, before I go into that, I want to answer another question I got that ties into this, and I'll do a combo back to part one, which you haven't seen, where I talk about my orchestra layout. The question was from um, one of the Twitter feeds, what sample libraries do I use and why? Uh, as I mentioned back in the day, hardware samplers were big and clunky and expensive and the libraries sucked. Um, then when I worked with, with Hans, he had his own private library that's recorded in this space in the UK called Air Studios. Now everyone knows the name Abbey Road. Abbey Road's the legend and I love Abbey Road. But Air Studios is this old church up in Hampstead with like four foot thick walls. It's like the real deal. And it's got this sort of hexagon shaped floor and a, an adjustable ceiling. Let's post a picture of the, uh, a couple of pictures of Air Studios in here now for those who haven't seen it. So, you know, the floor, old, you know, <clears throat> what do you call the inter, interlocked uh, type of wood floor and the ceiling adjusts up and down for acoustics. Anyway, it's an amazing space. There are lots of amazing spaces in the world for recording, but I, I spent so much time at Air recording for five years, I was there two, three, four times a year, and I, and just got to know every inch of that studio, every inch of every configuration. Um, we did a score with only celli and basses that in that room just sounded ginormous. And actually, Spitfire ended up making a twenty-eight celli eight bass library out of it, which I used on Hunter Killer. Um, so the reason I love the Spitfire libraries is because they're recorded in this space. There's no IR convolution reverb of air. It's it's to me the most amazing acoustic space that I've ever set foot in. Just walking and talking in that room is inspiring. So for me personally, I just know the sound of that room. I can hear the players. I can hear the configuration. Um, if I do antiphonal violins, I know exactly how those Debussy work. Things like this, the things you just gain out of of doing it, of real world experience. And there's you know choir lofts upstairs, which are for the choir, but you can also put French horns up there and all sorts of crazy shit. So the reason why I'm so deep on the Spitfire libraries is I've always wanted one orchestra library that has every instrument recorded in the same space. Because for so many years in the early days of, of orchestral sampling, you have that string library and the shorts from that string library, and you'd have that trumpet and those French horns, and they're all, you know, the, the island of misfit toys. And then you had to put them all into a reverb to try to gentrify them and make that work. And that was how it was in the early days. But now we have Spitfire, we have Mike Patty's set of samples, we have the Berlin guys, we have the guys out of Australia, um, where you can get basically the entire uh, families of the orchestra recorded in a single unified space. It's an amazing thing. I always say you should call up Christian Henson and Paul Thompson or Mike Patty or the Berlin guys and say, I refuse to pay so little for these libraries. It, you, know, you have no idea how awesome these are uh, if you're newish to the business. So let's uh, respect those. So anyway, to answer the question for what sample libraries do I use, I'm primarily uh, uh, Spitfire Audio. I think they're, they're, the recording quality is, is second to none. The use of the space, the control, the playability. You know, Paul and Christian are both composers and musicians, as is Mike Patty. And I have Mike Patty's library here too, but I'm partial to the space from the Spitfire libraries because of the studio it was recorded in. So I hope you get a chance to record at Air Studio someday in your career. It's truly amazing. All right, so that's the orchestra. Let's go into part two of my template, which is the non-orchestral stuff. And I'll show you how it's laid out. And I'm gonna give a little bit of a nod towards some busing questions that I got because this becomes apparent um, in the uh, non-orchestral stuff, okay? So over here. So back to this uh, screen recording of this is my template when I opened up in the morning. And just to review, if you haven't seen part one, go check that out, which is woodwinds, brass, piano, bells, harps, orchestral percussion, choir, strings, the way it reads on the page. We have this black divider line, which when the sequences get really thick and you're scrolling like crazy, it's actually quite helpful for me just to delineate. All right, so even though there's only a few folders here, they're pretty deep inside. So let's start with VIs. So I have them organized by food group um, so that they in turn get bussed to the right place. This is another video, but um, so, you know, for, let's go to ARPS, for example. 
Now, these are, you know, the ARPs of the moment. These are ephemeric. Is that a word? Ephemera? Well, they're, they're the, the, the ARP of the moment, you know what I mean? And like I mentioned before in my uh, VEP versus locally loaded contact video, if you haven't seen that one, you should check it out. I go into pretty deep into that. Is once something's in your template and you're locally loaded, like I am, and you open it up and you go, man, I'm tired of that, or I've used it six times, I just hit delete and it's gone. But if I make something or I make something custom or whatever, I just save it into the template, and there it is. So these are some, you know, shoes from different libraries or, you know, TMC is all my custom stuff, things that I use a lot. And here, if you look, you know, I might bigger. I know this is small in the screen capture. If you look here, what I have is I have what is called open high and open low. The reason that I have those is that I have two ARP stems in my synth master, again, we're going to busing for a second, which are ARPs high and ARPs low. I found over the years, those are helpful. They do different things, um, generally speaking. And when it comes time for the dub stage to do mixing, I find that if you want to have those separated, it's a good thing to have. So what I have is a few place card holders where it's already bust. All I have to do is go, I need a high ARP. Oh, I'm in the mood for Zebra. Whatever. Load your favorite high RP kind of, of synth or VI in there. It's already bust through my busting system the way I want. This is important, important way, important to the way that I work. And I realize not everybody works this way. I'm sort of a little deep on the, on the piping part of all this stuff. It takes forever to set up, but once it sets up, well, it works very quickly for me. And it's all about getting my ideas out and not doing anything technical as little technical as I can like busing. Um, so you'll see this pattern continue. So Anyway, these are some ARPs I have up, you know, different libraries that I'm using right now. Just, you know, I don't know, ARPs of the moment, right? So below that, pads. Um, same kind of thing. Just pads that I've, you know, some Olafur stuff or, you know, uh, Spitfires and ambient guitars, which are wicked. And I put shoes in there to remind myself that I can thumb through them different patches as opposed to one ofs. Um, you know, I have some, I have Diva, Reactor, you know, Stuff like that, you know. Uh, it's just pads I picked up that suit my taste. That's all. They're nothing special. They're usually slightly modified. I tend to not use preset anything if I can help it, uh, and or plugins or both. And at the bottom, you'll see here again, you'll see um, pad open high and pad open low. Again, in my busing, I have two pad tracks. They tend to do different things for different reasons. Um, and if there's only one pad, then pick one, right? Who cares? I'll explain this in another video. But the idea of having those ready to go rather than create a new track, take it, open it, bus it, then put the VI in, then my idea is kind of slipping away. This at least for me, my pea brain. So I like to have things ready to go. So there's a couple dozen pads that I use, whatever. Um, bases, same thing. There's only open... Uh, there's no high and low bases because it's bass, but you know some TMC stuff um, I've had made for me. Actually, a lot of that stuff, um, just patches that I found, and I, I thin, thinned this out recently with a lot of old clunky stuff. Because after a year over the course of a project, you're either sick of it or don't use it anymore. It's like throwing clothes out of your closet you haven't worn in a year. So there's an open base if I just wanted to try something else. Um, you know, Dark Zebra is always a favorite. That's on the on the ready. Drone City, that's pretty self-explanatory. And this is just, you know, whatever dozen drones that I, I, I use. And I do have a different stem for drones rather than basses because some drones are tonal, some drones are not tonal, whereas basses are tonal, if that makes sense. Um, but they still, the way a drone functions when you're writing a piece of music, whether it be dirgy or just to have that kind of bubbling lava layer underneath it, in the mix, it's used in a certain way, especially against dialogue and stuff like that. So I have my own drone stem, different than bass, different than bass ARP. I know, it gets deeper, trust me. Uh, Blade Runner, this was a funny name. I just was like going through some patches and I'm going, oh, that reminds me of Blade Runner, my, my, my favorite score of all time, one of my favorite scores, synth-based scores of all time. Both of them actually, but I'm referring to Vangelis. So these are just sounds that for some reason had a, you know, had a, a mod with a gate on it and something about it spoke to me of that really Scott aesthetic, which is like my favorite kind of filmmaking. So 
Delicacy, which is a uh, documentary that I just finished doing. Okay, percussion. Let's get into this for a second. So I have a couple, again, in the same pattern, a couple of open tracks, contemporary percussion. And remember, we have orchestral percussion up top, right? Low, mid, high, and metal. Each of those has a synth master stem. So the basses are on their own, the timpanis, the snares, and I, and I, can, I can print individual of anything in the whole sequence if I want to, but it gets a little unruly. So orchestral percussion has its own set of stems. Um, so does contemporary percussion, so does ethnic percussion. These are just the three food groups that came out of my time at Media Ventures that just the way we organized things and kind of stuck, you know. Again, in the, in the, in the scope of a hybrid score, think of a, a transformer score. There might be a temporal that leads to an orchestral gesture, then there's big power toms, and then maybe there's some tycos. Those are nice things to have control over in the mix because, again, they have different sounds. You know, uh, the ethnic stuff tends to be woodier, more personal sounding. The big ass action drums do what big ass action drums do. Uh, and the timpanis and snares do their own thing. They may be set back spatially to be more in the studio with the orchestra, etc. So we're taking these and we're thinking already about the interim busing, the final busing, the stems, if it goes to air or to a mixing engineer. So inside the percussion folder, I have... Um, folders of other percussion. This is some of Junkie's selects from, uh, from the um, uh, Spitfire stuff, buckets and whatever. And then Strike Force, which is a great library. You can do this two ways. You can do Strike Force as a multi where it's all in one thing. I actually have one of the entire library split out just because I like to be able to have more control over it. So Strike Force is Big drums, hybrids, you know, there's a whatever dozen of each of these. Uh, metals, small drums, snares, impacts and effects, half a dozen of those. Um, playable stuff, which is just something that I think of as things that I can really just with two hands jam out on, you know what I mean? Multi patches, a um, bunch of stuff in there. Loops, you know, just a bunch of. Again, TMC is my custom stuff that I've had made for me by Jorg Hutner. That's what JH means. Um, some libraries that I've go to, you know, stuff that I've had around. Some of these hybrid loops from ATO I've used enough on. They might get clunky and get deleted and some new stuff might go in there. But that's, you know, looped percussion. Things where it's a one finger wonder, you know, and that, that's a different way of thinking than programming it yourself. Um, TMC, this is my own library that I made. I recorded these at Warner Brothers Studios in here in Hollywood with two drummers, not one. And that the concept behind this was that I find that sometimes sampling is so perfect and so on the beat that it loses the energy of, of players. And we're always trying to emulate live players and hopefully hire live players down the road. So the idea of having two drummers hitting the same drum or different drums really was that it's never actually perfect. I wouldn't call it a flam, but it's not you know, to the atom, perfect. And I love that about it. So um, we did some certos and octavons and, you know, uh, tamborums and all sorts of other crazy stuff. That was a fun day of sampling. That was good. So that's my own stuff, which I like. It has a very, uh, a little bit of a drier quality to it than some other, the, the soupy libraries that are really cavernous. So again, they blend well against in action cues against things that are deeper in space. Uh, contemporary percussion. You know, all the Albion stuff, which I still love. The Darwin percussion so good. Uh, ethnic percussion, you know, just some basic stuff in here. This used to be five times this this thick. I just sort of thinned it out because there's stuff I haven't used in a while. Or sonically, I didn't like the sound of it. As my sound progresses, I didn't feel it suited me, for better or for worse. Uh, and then booms, which are what they say. I have a, an entire channel dedicated to the boom. I'm a big fan of the boom. Um, it's also one of the few times that I use a true LFE dot one plugin, which I've said before in other videos, if you're not an engineering kind of mind person or you don't understand how the dot one works, I would avoid it because if you use it wrong, it can make things problematic. But so booms are exactly what they say. Impact booms, soft booms, booms that, that I call it bloom, the bloom boom, uh, or reverb, you know, for soft or, or, you know, cues that need pathos, stuff like that. So there's um, percussion, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, 10 folders of percussion. Tune percussion, again, just what's in there right now, a lot of the ATO stuff, copper tones and uh, hang drums and, you know, stuff that's tuned percussion. Always looking for new tune percussion. Guitars um, are a combination of, you know, like the ATO Strat, which I use to imitate guitar for a real guitar player, as opposed to keeping it. Uh, whereas the Enigma, the Leo Enigma stuff from Spitfire is sit there and create textures out of guitars and their new Ambi guitar library with Spitfire. It's money, really good. Um, so that's the guitar folder. I'm not a guitar player, so I don't have like a gazillion trillion guitars. But, uh, you know, some people, if you're a guitar player, you're going to have Tarangos for every, you know, for days and stuff like that. Um, ethnic stuff, you know, just Dulcimers, Saz, Nickel Harpa, Bode Gamelon. Again, this folder used to be thicker too. I've been deleting stuff just to freshen it up, force myself to find new libraries instead of using the same old thing I've always used. Uh, sound design, this one gets pretty deep. So that's already 50 or so sound design. Then I have a whoosh, rise, and reverse folder, which is another 30 or 40. And then I have drones and atmospheres as another. So that's probably you know, pushing 100, 150 instruments. Just in sound design, which I generally think of as non-tonal, not always, no, not never, not always, but you know, like things that are either impacts or reverses or transitions to get you across of a, of a that was pretty cool, do you see that move? Transitions to get you across a scene change, um, just to let some air breathe out of something and go to an exterior shot. And so I, I love that stuff. And it's part of the hybrid vernacular. If you're more of a Rachel Portman sort of composer, then don't worry about this stuff. You don't need it. I like it because that's just my style, but it's you can make music without sound design in it. But So I got a ton of that stuff. Um, Condor, this template is based on my, my last project. So there's always a couple of things that are specific to uh, my project that I'm working on at the moment. I'll probably delete that. Hardware synths are all the synths that you see behind me. All that jazz, which is yet to be wired properly. Um, so I'm, I'm able to, with my setup, control all the synths locally at the synth itself and turn knobs and have that MIDI data set into Cubase so I can record and perform at the, at the that's the whole point of having a tactile synthesizer, right? Other than they sound better, they just do, is the ability to be, you know, not without the mouse. I hate the mouse. The mouse is the enemy of creativity in my book. So back over here, uh, unfortunately my, my wiring of my studio is not complete because of COVID, so they're not actually connected yet. The patch bays are coming in and all that stuff. But I can basically take, um, you know, control Moog One from the keyboard and do th shit to it here, or there's an editor for it. I'll go to the comp to the actual keyboard, turn the knobs, have that data sent into Cubase. So it really is either way. So I can physically want to say focus on the picture, or I can turn my back to it and go into a different space and go, I don't really care about that. I just want to go and find my way into a, a pad or an ARP or something like that. So there's my hardware collection, my synth addiction. This is a fun folder, new for TM. So if you haven't seen my video on VEP versus locally, locally loaded contact uh, and template ideas, go watch that because this is in it. The idea of getting a new library and having to either A, put it into your, your PC, your VEP build for PC, take up that space, bust it all into Cubase or whatever you use, audition it for a week and decide that you love it or that you hate it, and then have to take it out, delete the piping, delete the library or integrate it. The way we do it here is I say, I'm, I'm forever sending my assistant, buy me this, get me this. Today I sent him it was something mosaic based or whatever. And so he's constantly installing stuff. So he has a list that shows up on a, just a, on a, a text document of what's new. And he puts them in this new for TM folder. So check it out. So here is Tav sounds from New World. New World's a video game that I'm doing and Tav is one of my close buddies, synthesis that he is. Um, so, you know, he I hired him to make some banks for, for this game. And it's like, cool, got it. So then once it comes in, my assistant puts in the new for TM folder, I can then audition it um, and go, you know, cool, I love it. Or, which I love everything Tab does. I'm just saying, I can just, you know, audition it and either it works or it doesn't. Um, a couple of other libraries here. 
I don't even know what some of these are other than I asked for them. <laughs> uh, you know, Stratus, that's actually a pretty cool one. Um, so these are my, just like it sounds, new for TM. So let's say I like this, this patch. I go, oh, that's money. And it's going to go into the, say, ethnic folder, right? Make this smaller again. So what I'll do is I'll take this sound and I'll go, cool, cool, I love it. It's, it's now part of the palette, right? So I'll take this and I'll just drag it into, say, ethnic. Go to ethnic, disable it. And it's now part of the template. Super nimble, super quick way to work. Um, sorting out new libraries. Is, someone mentioned it in a post on YouTube. It's almost like a job unto itself. As a matter of fact, I think Mark Isham said he has a guy who does that for him. Because it's like, it can be overwhelming. So the way I handle it is I scour the web for things I like, have my assistant install it, bus it the best he can, you know, best, you know, best what he thinks is ethnic or it's a guitar, whatever. I go into new for TM, try it. No, don't like it. Try it. Oh, love it. Put it in the folder. Hit save. It's now part of the template. Next time I'll open it up. Oh, there's that thing again, right? So that's a cool way to work. And then the last folder is audio. Audio. And I have, back to my busting obsession. So what I have is I have some booms in metal that are set up. These are some custom things, things I've had around for a long time that I use that are in audio. And of course, the distinction between, is it the boom of justice or the boom of consequence? <laughs> I love this stuff. Um, so I have some audio ready to go. So check this out. Live vocals, live guitars, live cello, live violin, live ethnic, live percussion, live woods, sound design, audio, miscellaneous. And inside that say live vocals will be 10 vocal tracks. So let's say I hire a vocalist. I go, hey, hey, love. It's usually women. Can you sing over this cue? I'll give direction for two takes and say, then give me four or five other takes, whatever you want. Just whispier, louder, quieter, whatever. So then my assistant gets the drop from Dropbox from the singer, and it say it's eight or 10 tracks. So there's more, he'll just hit duplicate and make 20, just like that. He drags them all in, turns them all on. They're then bust to the Synthmaster sub, busing video, that Synthmaster sub, which is all her vocals, then gets a plug-in treatment that's usually a channel preset that I, all my singers, I have different channel presets for them because I know kind of what works. And instantly it sounds like film music. And now I'm inspired and it's not just the raw mic, it's already got some swimmy delays and the kind of things that I like on it. Um, and I can just go in and audition the vocals and go, that's the one. Or hey, these two in combination almost do like a duet kind of thing. It's so fast. And the busing stuff, which I, I know I'm going to get shit for from some of you guys because it sounds so nerdy. But for me, having it in place makes that creative process easy and inspiring and fast. So same thing if I hire a live, uh, you know, live guitar player, I put 10 of those in there. Or if I hire a live, uh, you know, I don't know, live woodwind player, which I do a lot, you know, there's 10 of those. And those are grouped to the woodwind submaster in the synth master, which then have their own treatment for it. So... You see the pattern how I like to work is I love hiring live musicians. I hire as many as I possibly can. I spend way more money than I should. Uh, not just the orchestra, but live guys. And I found a network uh, which has served me well during COVID of, of musicians that record at home. And this is sort of the, the brave new world for me even before COVID because I just don't have the time, generally speaking, to drive an hour or so to a studio to sit down for three hours, direct the talent to drive home. That's half my day gone. So I found musicians that I'm really in sync with who know my style and will just send me, like I'll holler Michael Levine, one of my good friends, very talented composer and great violinist. So I'll, I'll call up ML and say, hey, I need something that does this or I need kind of a Arvo-ish arpeggiated thing based on these chords and here's a chart, do stuff and send it to me. I'll drop them into my 10 violin tracks, put on his channel preset, off I go. Like just without any downtime for me, I get to hire musicians, everybody wins out of that deal, throw some work to my friends, and it comes into my busing system very quickly. So enough on busing. Uh, lastly, uh, we have live piano. I have a beautiful piano. It's right there. It's a Yamaha S6, which is different than the C series. Um, gorgeous instrument. Very, very good at low velocity, which is unlike most other Yamahas. 
which are more rock and roll, like Bruce Hornsby or, or Elton John sort of thing. Um, so I have a couple close mics and a couple more ambient mics to it, and they're busting the Cubase via my preamps behind me. Um, they're ready to go. So if I feel inspired, I can sit at the piano and I can hit record. I have a duplicate screen over there. It's really fast. It takes a while to set it up, but I, I really wanted to invest it this year in getting more into playing live piano to it. Um, <clears throat> Printback is a, an ethos that's been around forever, which is, it used to be actually a physical connection where the output of your rig would come back in stereo, back into your rig on a pair of record channels that were muted so you don't feed back and blow your speakers up. And so whatever you hear, whether it be a combination of pads or a stack of percussion or I don't know, whatever, you can print it. And now you have that as a consolidated piece of audio. You can do this through exporting, I know. Um, I just find this quicker. So if I, I don't know, make, made a pad or something and I really like it, I can just record it back for future use. If I'm stacking up drums to get multiple tom hits, I can just, after the cue's over, tell my assistant, go do, you know, whatever, a bunch of velocities of all these drums, and we now have a new, new drum library. Drop it on the sampler below, stuff like this. It's really quick. And print audition is because the print back, you cannot have it unmuted because it's the output. It will feed back and you will be not happy. So print audition is, as soon as it's printed, I drag it down to print audition so I can listen to it and see if I like it. All right, this is a bit of a longer video, but that is the non orchestral side of my template below this line. There's a lot below that line. <laughs> um, so I hope that makes sense. I appreciate your comments and all that stuff. I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, put them below. And I, I keep floating the idea of my busing. Everyone seems to be really into it. it it's, it's pretty deep stuff. So uh, you got to kind of wear your seatbelt for that one. But if you guys are interested in that, I'll, I can do a deep dive on my, my busing, which is kind of a three level thing and involves surrounding and all sorts of other stuff. But Anyway, it's just fun sharing this stuff with you guys. I want to know how you guys work. Post below that what resonates from this. You go, dude, that's a cool way to work. Or, dude, that would never work that way. You know, there's no always, there's no never. This is just the way my brain works for better or worse. Um, so put your comments below. I really am interested. Um, if you're just starting off or if you're one of my pro composer buddies, um, let's, let's, I'm always, I always say, I think I have the most efficient way for, to work for me, but I'm ready to have my mind change at any moment. So it says, by the way, have you ever thought about doing it this way? I go, if it's better, it's in. It's not an ego thing, you know what I mean? I love finding new ways to do things. So there it is, ask me anything. Cubase template part two, and we'll keep it going.